Okay, so here we go. This is week two of Aesthetics and Theory of Communication. Um, really quickly, just some announcements um, and updates for the course. Uh, I'm working through the, um, the week one uh, visual uh, mission statement activities. Most of you have my feedback now. Um, there's a few left that I'm going to finish up tonight. So if you haven't seen that yet, you will. Um, the way I do the feedback is that I uh, put comments directly on your document and I upload the document to FSO and then you can grab it and pull it down and, and take a look at what I have uh, as far as feedback and comments on the document itself. Um, and since this is this project works in stages, you're develop, building it up uh, piece by piece, the way I uh, handle the grades is that if you make changes based on the feedback um, and correct some of the concerns that I have, I will take a look at it again when you turn it back in, you know, with the new sections added and um, adjust your grade accordingly um, up to 10 points different. So, you know, if you got an 85, for example, you could bring it up to a 95 if you made all the necessary changes. Um, my feeling is simply that um, a one-time grade is, is, uh, doesn't give an opportunity to learn from the feedback. And so this way you can uh, see what's, what's happening and, and uh, adjust and kind of get a better understanding. So be aware of that. Oh, um, but if you do make changes to your project, um, let me know. Just put a little comment along with your week two upload, you know, saying I have made changes to week one. Um, so I know to go back because um, actually uh, I'm kind of surprised not, not that many of my students take advantage of that opportunity. So um, instead of hunting for those changes, um, if you let me know that they're there, I'll know where to look. Um, so there's that. Um, I'm a little bit behind where I like to be as far as grading. I really would prefer to have had this uh, assignment graded. Okay, guys, stuff now. Mama has, has her stuff, okay? Um, so she... Sorry? Hi, Sheila. Welcome to the class. I'm getting a lot of background noise from your microphone. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, so, but uh, my plan is to finish those up tonight and uh, and then get the uh, get caught up with the Photoshop uh, grading as well, but, but between now and tomorrow. So look for that, uh, for those to be posted really soon. And other announcements, next week we'll return to the um, regular Wednesday evening. Uh, meeting meeting time, so um, just be aware of that. Um, and the only other announcement that I can think of is for campus students. I know there are a few of them in class this month. Um, campus students are not required to attend the Friday Blend class meeting um, this month because your class is online, but you're encouraged to um, if you're able to because that way you keep in touch with everybody and keep up with what's going on in the Friday Blend projects. If you're an online student, don't worry about any of that because it doesn't apply. Did you have any questions or uh, concerns that I could address really quickly? No problem. Um, 
I'm glad you're able to get logged in. And um, and as far as the microphone goes, you know, you're welcome to turn it off and on as you need if you want to ask any questions. Okay, so um, in week one, we uh, defined what uh, aesthetics was and part of the the current the definition that we're working with is that aesthetics is the interaction of different media elements and uh, and the way that they influence our perceptual reactions uh, we dealt with a little bit with imagery and do visual storytelling as part of that as, as elements within that that uh, you know, percep within that design that influence our per perceptual reactions. And the new element that we're adding this week is that of color that we're taking into a consideration. Color is, um, is actually very influential as far as how we perceive uh, any type of visual media, both in terms of the um, emotional response or, or connection that we have with that the imagery, but also with... Um, with the emphasis, you know, wh where our eye goes, what catches our eye first. And media creators have certainly taken very good advantage of both of those factors to, um, you know, to create a very, a very well-planned experience for their audiences. So we'll look, take a look at some of the, um, some of the ways that the, that can be done this month. Have either of you ever worked with uh, the color wheel? or with color theory in an art class or anything along those lines? Okay, a little bit, yeah. I think we tend to encounter the color wheel at some point. Um, this is the basic color wheel. It's very simple. If you look at the color uh, chooser in like Photoshop, it's thousands of tiny gradients of color. Um, so you can break it down to, you know, very minute variations. This is a very basic color wheel that has the primary colors, which are um, yellow, red, and blue. And the secondary colors, which are combinations of those colors, green, orange, and violet. And then you can continue to mix those to get the tertiary colors that are in between. Um, you don't get too bogged down in terminology. They're, it's good to know, and it's covered in the uh, Melinda lesson, um, but, um, but I'm not gonna quiz you on that. What I'm more interested in, as far as our concerns go, are how these colors interact with one another and how you can make use of those interactions to create a very specific experience for your viewers. Um, here's something that, that the three of us might be familiar with, and that's the use of makeup concealer. Um, if you look at how um, concealer is used, you'll notice that orange neutralizes the blue. If you have the blue circles under your eyes, for instance, green neutralizes red, whereas the more red or pink neutralizes green. Um, here's kind of a summary of that. And notice these combinations, red and green, blue and uh, purple and yellow, and blue and orange. And then look at how, where those are arranged on the color wheel. Orange is the opposite of blue on the color wheel. Yellow is opposite purple. Red is opposite green. So what's happening there is that this color wheel is arranged according to how we actually perceive color. Our optic nerves actually receive and, and interpret color. Um, those colors that are offset one another actually compete for our, the, the, I believe it's the cones in your eyes that perceive color. Um, and it has, and those, those little receptors have difficulty interpreting those two colors at the same time. So they kind of compete for attention. Um, and that's why when you put yellow concealer on purple circles under your eyes, it neutralizes. Um, <clears throat> which isn't, which is kind of an interesting fact, but um, not that 
practical for media creation, but what is practical about that information is that um, when you put those two colors close together, you still have that competition. And so there's sort of a, a, a strong contrast, a visual kind of uh, almost a vibration that takes place and it creates an energy in the image. Here's an example. And this is the movie poster for Amelie. Notice that uh, they used complementary colors, and that's what the, the term for those, those kind of colors that uh, have strong contrast, the opposites. They use complementary red and green to make her stand out because those two colors are conflicted with one another visually. If we take that color away, I notice that the entire mood of the poster changed and the emphasis of the poster changed. It's almost shifted more to the, the bright yellow uh, of the title rather than the character herself. And that's, that's the idea of color theory applied to a visual design. Um, you get to choose the mood and the energy that you put into your image based on those color choices. Also, you get to uh, influence where emphasis is placed. And there's a, a bit of a side by side. So based on that idea that colors that are opposite on the color wheel have strong contrast with one another and compete for your perception, um, you can then start to plan some different color relationships. A little bit of terminology really quickly is you'll hear me refer to warm and cool colors. And those are uh, differentiated based on um, their association with, uh, for example, warm colors are reds and oranges and yellows those colors that are uh, called to mind ideas of, of warmth or fire or heat. You know, the burner on your stove turns red when it heats up. These are very innate to us to evoke feelings of warmth. And whereas the blues and purples and, and greens uh, are the cool colors and, and they're more associated with water or ice or, or cold, you know, the feeling of the cold. Um, Warm colors have more, tend to have more energy and tend to look like they're popping out, like towards you, whereas cool colors appear to recede into the background and have a lower energy, typically. Um, so typically, when you pair some of these opposite colors, you're pairing a warm color with a cool color. So you get some additional... Um, contrast. Whereas if you're combining colors that are closer together on the color wheel, it's, it's lower contrast. It's more harmonious and more calm. All right. So um, with those, that rule in mind of opposites have strong contrast, colors that are more similar, have lower contrast and more harmony, you can start planning some the basic color schemes. These are uh, color relationships that have been used by artists for centuries. The most basic is monochromatic. And I noticed in uh, some of the, sometimes in the exploration assignments that monochromatic uh, color scheme is sometimes misinterpreted. Um, what it means is there is only one color used in that entire image. Um, it might be uh, lighter or darker variations on that color, like and this is uh, one of Picasso's paintings, um, and he's used very light pale blues to create light and deeper blue to make shadow, but it's all still blue. Um, monochromatic designs, here are some more modern examples. Um, can be very elegant. They can have a sense of energy or emotion, but they 
they don't take advantage of that color contrast um, like some of the complementary colors will, um, but it can create the, the right mood at times. And it's really influenced by whether you choose warm colors or cool colors. Here's Harry Potter um, from one of the two Deathly Hallows films, I believe. Oh no, this is Half-Blood Prince. Um, with uh, using the cool blues and it gives a sense of, of chill. There's even snow in the air. And uh, so it's, it's kind of evokes that, that feeling of that movie where the storyline is becoming a little more dark and a little more grim. And uh, so this is, you know, any of the other earlier Harry Potter movies, the posters had more of an orange and blue. So until it starts getting into these, these darker uh, story arcs. And then Gladiator is a monochromatic yellow with darker shades of yellow and lighter tints. Um, a lot of times what we call brown, by the way, is either a dark tint uh, or a dark shade of yellow or orange or red. So it still falls into that category, that monochromatic category. Notice the difference that the warm colors make. It's fiery. It feels like it's there's a tension and um, like a coiled spring that there could be action at any moment, and almost like the sky's on fire. So very different moods. And you can get a, a lot out of using single colors, but it's pretty limited in terms of the color richness and the interest that you can create. So more often than not, you'll want to include a variety of colors in any given design. Um, so then you have a choice of your analogous colors, and that those are the colors that are more similar to one another, um, or complementary, and those are the ones I've been talking about. They're opposites. They um, have that stark contrast, which creates a dynamic energy. You see those used a lot in um, action films, both in the movie posters and the movies themselves. Here's the example from classical art. This is a Monet painting the Japanese bridge, and these are analogous colors. They're relatively close on the color wheel. So it creates that sense of calm. It's a very calm garden. It, it is uh, very peaceful. You might go there to kind of relax and, and feel some you know, a sense of serenity. If you had if he had thrown in, say, a, a bright red or orange, it would really change that whole feel. It would stand out and, and be sort of a, um, a distraction or at least a, a, uh, an element that draws your eye more sharply than anything in this image. And again, the colors that you choose influence the actual perception of your designs, even if it's analogous, it's still kind of a harmonious feel, even though there's a sense of humor with the bug's life. He's the little ant peeking out the hole in the leaf, but um, this is almost the same color scheme as the Monet painting. And Angry Birds. This was somebody's uh, example from the exploration. I don't remember whose exactly, so I'm not sure if it was one of your, your two. Um, but um, what I like about the Angry Birds poster is that um, it's using the analogous colors um, with a really good association to emotion because it's, it's this angry red bird. And red is something that we often associate with anger or strong emotion. And so it really accentuates the, the expression in the eyes here too. Uh, but we have a lot of variations with sort of this more peach colored feathers and the yellow beak and orange eyes. So um, still in the analogous ring.
Okay, so really notice how um, all the colors here are, are fairly similar, even though the the light kind of yellow green stands out because it's it's lighter. It uh, it still is relatively harmonious. And now compare that to complementary colors. Now you have really harsh contrast, and this lets you put really strong emphasis on things. This is. Um, I don't have the tag, but this is a uh, Vincent Van Gogh painting. I think it's called something along the lines of Cafe at Night, but um, you can see those warm versus cool colors, how the warm cafe scene really pops out, whereas the blue city at night kind of recedes away, makes that that central cafe scene really really grab your attention. Just as a side note, you can also see some other strategies he's used to direct attention. Look at where all the lines are paint pointing in the uh, in the painting as well. It kind of draws your attention to that central table where that couple is seated. So that becomes the uh, the focal point. But really powerfully uh, emphasized through the use of color. near a couple of complementary examples. So you see the, the color contrasts are so much sharper than what we saw with the bug's life or, um, or what was the other example of, oh, angry birds. Did you guys have any questions or thoughts so far? Any observations that you would wanna share? And here's a question for the two of you, actually. Um, in these two posters, what impact do you see the, that color contrast having? How does it influence how you uh, perceive these, these images? And this isn't, there isn't a right or wrong answer, just uh, strictly your own observations. We'll get into some specific uses for these um, in a little while. Just you know, some strategies how you can make use of these color ideas. Um, but you know, just notice how having that bright orange circle of the moon or the sun going down um, is almost like putting a spotlight on Ariel in the in the Little Mermaid poster. There's you know, it's. There's no missing that. Your eye, eye isn't really going to wander very easily to any other elements. Similar with the, the uh, Mad Hatter in the Alice in Wonderland, um, that green background was put back there very purposefully because of all the red that's in his hair and his hat and so forth. And it gives that sense of depth and that sense of uh, energy and, and that little pop of color. Okay, so the basic relationships that I want to emphasize really are just analogous and complementary. There are a whole lot of variations on those that we could go into. The Linda lesson talks about a few of them. Um, but if you understand that, you know, the colors that are more similar are going to give you uh, a more calm effect, whereas colors that are more different or come from more opposite sides of the color wheel 
will give you more of a high energy uh, excitement, then that will go a long way. That basic rule will, will inform your color choices. And the, the really the last option that I, that I want to mention is that of achromatic. That means no color. It's completely colorless. Um, this is your black and white or grayscale images. Uh, my classic art example is M.C. Escher, who always did these really interesting pen and ink illustrations. But, um, uh, you know, it's all, it's all colorless. Black and white are not considered colors in formal color theory. They are values, which means lightness and darkness. And the same goes for gray. So when you think about complementary colors, black and white will never factor into complementary color relationship because they're non-colors. Um, so instead you have achromatic as the term that describes those images. Um, usually they have a, a lower energy because you're not getting that color contrast and that excitement that that can add. Um, it can be really interesting. It can be very elegant and compelling. Um, but uh, will often have more of a lower energy. Sometimes can be very depressed in the mood, and we'll see that it's often used for things that are very serious and very gritty. Um, but again, there's there's no absolutes. So even though it tends to be really depressed, you can use achromatic images that are very elegant and very um, very pleasing to look at. couple of examples, um, the 007, very serious tone, uh, espionage films. Um, this one, The Furious Seven, I include because, um, and I think this actor's name was Paul Walker, is that correct? Um, this poster is actually, was actually created as a uh, memorial for him after he passed away. Um, he and and uh, Vin Diesel were actually very close friends, and so using that achromatic color scheme um, is a way of kind of expressing their their mourning. Um, this is uh, you may notice that there is some color. You know, you can see some of the skin tones, but it's so muted that it's for all practical purposes is achromatic. Um, in the in the mood it express expresses, and there's some tricks you can use with the black and white imagery, throwing in an accent color to draw attention or add symbolism. Um, thinking about our visual metaphors and symbolism from visual storytelling. This is Schindler's List, where you've seen the whole movie in black and white, and then suddenly the splash of color appears. And some exa other examples from our exploration that uh, you guys chose. Um, look how striking this image is. Like, what does that evoke as far as your um, your reactions? What would you expect of this movie based on what you see here? A lot of blood and death. And I guess simply the name Quentin Tarantino could also be a clue that you're going to see a lot of blood and death. But yeah, I mean, this looks like blood being you know, streaked across the page where the, you know, the wagon wheels and the, the horse uh, hooves have made a trail. Um, and it has that achromatic, that black and white, that's very, very gritty, very uh, kind of has a lot of weight is like in, in the sense of emotional weight um and then you throw in that red and it's just a very powerful uh, image it's, uh, has a very um very impactful visual impression this was another one from uh from you guys is uh explorations and and they're a very similar one uh, and again it's not 
not truly achromatic because you do have some skin tones and a little bit of blue in the eyes, but it's so desaturated that it's practically colorless except for that symbolic red of the Mockingjay. And if you've seen these movies, you know they get pretty, uh, pretty dark, and especially at this point. And, uh, and there's themes of revolution, and uh, you know, and fighting for freedom. So that uh, that red symbol is very powerful in uh, in capturing that idea. Are there any questions so far? That that was uh, a lot of information. That's the basic crash course on the essentials of color theory. Um, but from here, I want to go into a little bit of what is it? What that means? How do you apply that in different ways? So, any any thoughts so far? Okay, great. Um, and hopefully some of these examples coming up will help further clarify um, why this matters. So one of the, the ways that maybe most often comes to mind about using color in media is to create mood. You see color psychology uh, mentioned with different associations, you see specific colors. I really don't like to put a lot of uh, attention into that though because you can't really prescribe meanings to colors because it will be different depending on the context on uh, the culture that you're within and the individual preferences and so forth um, but color can be an influence almost in the same sense that a musical score in a movie influences your mood it's it's a subtle enhancement of what's being shown Take a look at this ad um, for the Renault, um, and I'm not sure which car this is, but um, how do you see color being used in this example? What part does it play in telling the visual story or setting the tone and the mood for, um, for the ad, the message that it's sending? Okay, when you mentioned color contrast being important, um, can you talk a little more about that? Like, where do you see the contrast taking place? Okay, red and black, right. Um, yeah, and, and the black definitely draws your eye. Black, you know, black um, wouldn't be considered a color in terms of you know, complementary colors or analogous colors, but it, it certainly still plays a role. So you're not, you're definitely not wrong. Um, but also look at how the color connects to the message of the ad. The verbal message, re to rekindle the flame of desire, you only need a drop of petrol. And the whole scene is red with a red car. Yeah, and there you go. And, and Sheila's saying, I'd have to say that they might be trying to sell the sex appeal of the car. 
if there is such a thing for a car, right? Um, but the same could be said about the red and implying the speed of the car. Yeah, both of those are good points. Red is a color that we um, often associate with um, strong emotion, and it could be um, passion. Think about Valentine's Day. Everything is red, the red hearts, red roses. Um, it can be um, energy and excitement or action. Uh, it can be danger uh, and, and risk. But um, it is always something very strong and very emotional. And so by throwing this red color up you know, with a red car, so the car is basically going to blend into the background, but that's you know, that's that's okay in this case. They're not trying to make the car stand out necessarily. Um, but it connects to this idea of the flame of desire. It's that, that sexiness, right? The sex appeal of the car. Uh, sex appeal in quotation marks. Um, and you only need one drop of petrol. So at, this, at one, in, 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 in one statement, they're both emphasizing the attractiveness of the car, maybe the excitement of driving the car, as well as the fuel efficiency of the car. But certainly leveraging our associations with color in order to do that. Um, looking back at movie posters again, here we have use of the warm and cool colors and the emotional uh, uh, perception that go along with those. Remember, cool colors are low energy, whereas warm colors are more high energy. That uh, translates to mood as well. Cool colors tend to be more, uh, I don't want to say depressed, but um, can be depressed, but more of a lowered mood, whereas warm colors evoke more, uh, more energy and more upbeat uh, feelings. And then and see how they've connected those to the two scenes shown here with Jason Bateman struggling with the two toddlers and his face has this very troubled, uh, struggling expression. And that's connected with this, this teal, this cool teal blue. Whereas Ryan Reynolds has, is here with two young ladies and clearly from his face having a much better time than Jason Bateman is. And that's associated with that warm, bright orange. And what you'll see is that this exact same technique is used in film and television to underscore the mood of each scene and each character. Here is a crazy infographic. Um, this is a lot to look at, but um, what you're looking at, have either of you watched the series Breaking Bad? Yeah? What this graphic shows is the color associations in each episode for each character, each main character in the series. So this is an insane amount of information that someone has collected. Um, also, if you haven't, um, Sheila, you've, you've watched it. Anybody else listening to the archive, if you haven't watched the series, I should say spoiler alert, because I'm going to talk a little bit about some details with some of the characters. I like to focus on Jesse Pinkman. And how would you describe Jesse Pinkman, Sheila? He's emotional and a problem, yes, and he perhaps has emotional problems, in fact. Um, he is very um, hot-tempered. He runs off of the mouth a lot, has a, has, you know, curses every other word, um, and is easily provoked, at least at first. He has a lot of character development, but notice the, the colors that associate with him in this timeline. It's a lot of warm colors, right? A lot of those fiery reds and yellows. And uh, certainly not a coincidence. That is very much planned. Let's take a look. Here are some scenes. 
It's either his clothing, the jacket, the hats, his shirt, or the car he's driving, even looking in the environment, the red that's behind him in this scene. Um, all that is planned. It's not simply left to chance. But um, as you can even see in this quote, I want to do the color timing for each episode. Each of these episodes where you sit with the colorist and make sure that the color for each individual scene is just the way you want it. And that's Vince Gilligan who created the series. Um, so they're using that color to add flavor to the character, add that visual, uh, kind of a visual musical score telling us how to feel about this character. But if we look at the timeline, there's some interesting um, events. Look at right here. This is a number three. It's probably really tiny on your end. Um, but if you look at the, the key or the legend of what that corresponds to, number three says, abducted by Tuco, who's a really bad guy. Um, and then at that point, some, you know, this is not a very good time for Jesse Pinkman. It goes from this streak of red to suddenly black. There is no color because things are pretty dark in a figurative sense for him at that point. Um, so the colors associated with him are dark. This could be, you know, again, his T-shirt, his clothing, even the room he's in maybe is dark. But... When you encounter Jesse during this time period, it's not uh, not a very bright and cheerful time. And that changes. You can see the, the colors come back, the yellows and the reds, for a while. And then at number five, suddenly it goes from red, a streak of red, to this kind of gray-green into black, and white, and gray. So it goes achromatic on us. <clears throat> At point number five, the legend down here says Jane dies, and Jane's his girlfriend at the time. Um, so it's like this tragic event in his life. The emotion goes from this, I think they were having a lot of parties at the time, to this depression. And then at point number six, he goes into rehab. So it's kind of, he's hitting this very low point, and the colors go along with that. And I saw your comment that you, you didn't really think about tying the, the color choices to the characters. But, um, but yeah, you'll notice this. If you, you know, start paying attention to this um, wherever, you know, whatever you're watching and notice that it's not only, not only the characters themselves, but the scenes, the action that's taking place will be underscored through color. Some more examples. Um, this is from the movie The Matrix. And I'll say spoiler alert again, but hopefully I don't have to because this one's pretty dated now. Um, in The Matrix, it's a science fiction film. The premise is that it all takes place in a virtual world. It's all computer simulated, but they don't tell you that at first. You kind of figure it out as the story progresses. But they, there's hints, there's clues, because everything has this weird green tint to it. So it doesn't quite feel natural. It, you know, it feels like some kind of very, there's an unearth, a subtle but unearthly feeling to it. Things just aren't right. And it's the, the hint that you know, they are in this false world that has deceived everyone for so long. But when they finally get out of that into the, quote, real world of the film, now you see more natural colors. You see natural skin tones. Uh, everything is a little bit sharper and, and more lifelike. It doesn't have that sickly green. This particular scene is a little exaggerated because they've been celebrating and everybody is, has been dancing and they're sweaty and and so forth, but, um, but that's really an example of what, of how they made use of that, that impression. And a third environment is when they're still in the quote, real world 
of the movie, but they leave the safety of their home out into this post-apocalyptic landscape and everything is gray and cold blues. It's concrete and steel and lifeless. And it, they wanted you to feel that feeling of, of cold and uncaring uh, lifelessness by using these colors. You don't feel like they're safe anymore. Like in, in this case, it feels healthy. It feels uh, more upbeat. Now it's very grim, very dark. So using color to um, influence the feel of each scene as well. Or also time periods. Um, logically, we know that in the 1920s, they had the same colors that we have now. Everything looked the same way as we would see it now. But, um, but as modern you know, people in modern times, when we think about that time period, it's, it's all very old, it's antique. And so to evoke that, that sense that we're looking at a, an older time period, they have used the sepia filter to give it that antique look. That slight orange red kind of uh, tint. This is from the movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? It's just a really good film if you haven't seen it. <clears throat> and I mentioned how these complementary colors are used in a lot of action films, especially these blockbuster uh, action films like The Avengers and the Iron Man or the Transformers uses this as well. You'll see it basically in every action film <laughs> poster is orange and blue or orange and teal and uh, it's very popular with Hollywood uh, there are articles about this some pretty critical uh, articles about how often they use this color scheme the orange and blue um, but it but it's practical in a sense because it uh, it has the complementary colors so lots of action lots of energy um, it has this nice cool versus warm contrast so it lets you create a cool blue backdrop for this warm colored character to act against. He pops forward and really kind of gets in your face in a sense um, because of that, that contrast. Somebody posted the, and I, I didn't include it in the slides, but the, um, the poster from the new Star Trek beyond film that uses a very similar strategy to create that sense of action and depth. And Sheila, I think this one is yours, if I remember. Um, and we, you talked pretty, pretty well about how they use this color to evoke that, uh, the feeling and the themes. There's a lot of um, violent themes in this film, but it's really a very uh, powerful depiction of, of mental illness, actually, of, of a you know, psychotic disorder. Um, and I think their use of color here is really effective for in both of those cases. You have this almost achromatic design with splashes of red, and that's that red that's very violent and very passionate. And even the white, bleach that white of the background is kind of a ghostly effect. That um, you know, so much of the movie, and I really even hate to, to give anything away about this film, but um, uh, a lot of it is in the, in the mind of this dancer who is, is uh, essentially psychotic is you know, kind of detached from reality. I've been focusing really heavily on film and TV and, and movie posters, which are an extension of film, but this applies across the board. Uh, I, I want to be really media neutral in this entire course because um, 
these ideas apply wherever you whatever you're working with. This is a website design. And um, looking at this website, what um, what mood would you expect to get from this site? What kind of tone would you expect to see if you read the content of this site? Any thoughts on this? Um, what, um, could you expand on that? What you meant by less red? Like what, what mood would you expect or tone would you expect? to get from the content of the site based on the colors they've used. Okay, it's very, kind of has something of a retro feel. Um, okay. Um, take a look at, we I mean, notice first of all the color relationship that they've got. It's uh, this sort of teal and green paired with orange. So it's got a complementary color uh, combination from opposite sides of the color wheel, right? Um, so it's going to give it sort of a, a really upbeat energy, a dynamic feel. And it does have something of sort of a retro style. You can see that in the, the typefaces used, some of the art style as well. And then, so it's, it's sort of got a more high energy uh, color scheme. And then if you start looking at the content, um, you see that it's very tongue in cheek. It's very they, silly um, in their approach. So like the kid, picture the kid with the mustache drawn on. Their slogan is great websites, no lame marketing slogans. Um, and text copy, like seriously, these days everyone and their mom has a website. So it's obvious they're not trying to convey a very serious and business-like uh, brand identity. Instead, they're being very fun, playful, and the colors correspond to that because of that, that color contrast and the energy that it provides. What's really, um, what this is a good illustration of actually is the idea of context. Almost the same color scheme was used for the Iron Man movie uh, image that we saw a minute ago. And that was fun in a sense that film is, is an action a comic book film, so it's meant to be entertaining um, and sometimes funny, but overall it's it's not intended to be a comedy. Um, but those same colors used here in this context give it kind of enhance the comedy um, element. So my point is um, that the same color scheme can be used in different contexts to have different meanings because Color is only adding to the energy of it. So it will enhance what's already there. Um, and it's enhancing the fun aspect of this or the action aspect of Iron Man. So um, uh, this is something I, I really want to drive home because too often I see uh, 
my students as well as discussions online about you know, this color has this specific meaning. Blue is always a trustworthy color or a serious color. Um, and it's just not the case. It really depends on how you're using those colors. Okay. Um, if you do have any questions, please feel free to jump in. I, I do try to pause occasionally, but um, it, since it's just the three of us, it's not too big of an issue if you do want to turn on the microphone or put something in the chat. But for sake of time, let's keep moving along. Um, so that's that's one use of color for media is to establish mood, underscore the meaning and the, the message, um, and add, add emphasis in more of a an emotional sense. But you can also use color to add emphasis in a literal sense. And your question is: Is orange a great color for a poster? And the answer is: It depends on what the poster is for. What you know, what the purpose of the poster is, and what the content of the poster is. It can be a great color for a poster um, if orange is the right color for your subject matter. Um, you determine that by considering what um, what the subject is. If it has any specific color associations, um, then you might want to go with those. Um, if not, then you're, you're more free to choose. And uh, if, if orange, you know, think about what orange is. It's a warm color, so it's going to be more high energy. Um, it, um, I'm trying to think if it has any kind of specific associations, and really it's sort of neutral. Um, but, uh, you know, if that that feeling of energy suits your design, then yeah, it's, it would be great. So it's kind of more of a case by case thing. If, if you had a specific case that you wanted to, wanted me to look at, I could. <clears throat> <clears throat> so using color for emphasis, and this is emphasis in the sense of um, almost putting a spotlight on a specific detail, calling attention to a particular element. And when you look at this, where does your eye go first? This is actually an image I stole from a friend's Instagram uh, account that they took. And it goes to the mushroom, right? And this is, this is a complementary color pair, green and red. So it's going to have the highest possible contrast. And since the entire background is red or green, the thing that's different is going to be what draws your attention. This is used in a lot of movies. And this is used really across the board as far as media goes. Um, this is from the, the recent uh, live action Cinderella film and this gold coach with her uh, bright blue dress, it, you know, it, your eye, besides the fact that it's, it's arranged so that she is right at center, that adds a little bit extra emphasis to her by using that gold color that's essentially a, a yellow-orange hue and draws, you know, contrast with the blue. Um, you know, you think about the filmmakers planning this. Yes, gold is a very elegant color. It's a very, uh, a, very much a symbol of wealth. They could have gone with any other color, though. Um, you know, it could have been a white coach or, you know, multi or even wood grain. <laughs> but, uh, but they use that probably not entirely. You know, probably the, the the fact that it would contrast against that gown probably was a factor with the production design. And this is almost the same as the mushroom picture. Uh, this is Harry Potter. Um, I don't know exactly which film this is from, but it doesn't really matter. Um, this is the Quidditch match, and it's a very fast-paced action scene. And it would be easy to lose 
your attention or lose your focus. You don't really know where to look because so much is happening. But look how they've attracted attention using Harry Potter in his red Gryffindor robes uh, put against a green background. And even the towers where the spectators are sitting, um, they're kind of yellow, but they've been given a, a bit of a green tint, so they're kind of going into the green range, so that wherever we look, Harry Potter is going to stand out. So even though he's moving very quickly around the screen, um, our eye is always going to be drawn to that point. And they maintain our focus in that way. Yeah, you know, Draco, Draco Malfoy in his green Slytherin robes, even though he's closer, blends in. So he's kind of uh, not our focal point. Instead, it's eyes stay on Harry. This is really useful. I mean, this is a useful technique in any media. If it's still images or a website or or in motion picture and film and TV, um, you direct attention using these color relationships. This is a simple complementary color pair. And we've seen this one already um, in the same idea. There's some really interesting ways that this is used. Um, I used to, I, I don't have the, the image in my slideshow anymore, but I used to have a picture from the, the movie Life of Pi. And in that movie, you're, the, it almost entirely takes place on a life raft. And you see that the, the inside of the life raft is, or lifeboat is all orange, very bright orange. And the, the raft that he builds is all orange. And it really stands out sharply against the sea and the sky, which is all blue. And of course, orange and blue is complementary color pair. Well, that wasn't actually the filmmakers doing. Uh, lifeboats are made orange specifically for that reason, because if the rescuers are looking for you, it will stand out more sharply because of the complementary color pair. So real life application as well. In fact, there's more than that. Um, Anytime you look at the news, you'll notice that the backdrop is almost always blue. Sometimes it looks like there's some kind of monitors, something important going on back there. Sometimes it's just sort of a, a branded backdrop or a skyline or what have you. But that is by design as well, because all of our natural skin tones are in the warm color range. And putting that cool color behind the newscaster or the reporter um, will make sure that they are front and center, that they are the focal point. You know, hopefully, if you're watching the show, you'll be paying attention to them anyway, but this makes them pop that much more. So, uh, very clever use of knowledge of color. And this is just a simple complementary color idea. Any thoughts or questions about any of that? This, this lecture tends to be my the longer of the four for the month, but uh, so a little bit longer to go, but I appreciate you bearing with me. Um, so this idea will can play a part. Say this week in your Photoshop practice, you're going to create another simple visual story, um, but you're, in, you're manipulating the color in this case. So you can increase or decrease the emphasis on a particular element using uh, you know, changes in color, or you can uh, manipulate the mood of the scene. In week four, when you create your own design, you can do the same thing. And then in the future, as you create more media projects, these are ideas that you can keep in mind. Um, if you're shooting a video uh, for you know, your, your upcoming video uh, production classes, you can think about wardrobe, you can think about background and so forth, and the mood and impression that it gives. So my last topic, and... Uh, 
This will probably be the most relevant part of this for your uh, mood board project this week. And that is color for the sake of branding. And branding, um, as you probably know, is much more than simply the logo of your, your product. It is every aspect of that subject's personality. So it includes things like the tone of voice that's used in their media, um, the typefaces that are used, the colors and the symbols being the logo. Color is fundamental to that. These are probably pretty familiar uh, brands with uh, very distinct colors, especially Starbucks with the green logo. What if we reverse those colors? Suddenly it's not the intuitive brands that we, we know and love, right? It suddenly just doesn't look right. It doesn't feel right. If you saw that logo on a cup, you wouldn't immediately acknowledge that it's Starbucks unless you gave it another more than a passing glance. So this is kind of illustrates how important color is to a brand. In fact, UPS refers to their the brown and gold in some of their marketing. So it kind of uh, evokes a bit of a, a second glance. It's, it's, uh, because it's become so integral to their personality that it's kind of like seeing your best friend with a different eye color or something. Every uh, organization and brand has a style guide. Somewhere there is a style guide that codifies these colors and gives specific digital color codes for reproducing those colors. Um, because whatever graphic artist is working on the project, they need to be able to exactly uh, repeat those colors to keep the brand consistent. This is uh, actually directly from the Full Sail um, style guide that I obtained from Platinum Creative um, from our marketing department. They wouldn't let me share the color codes, but I could sh share the swatches. Any kind of full cell material is going to contain at least these two colors, this burnt orange, and I always call this kind of an olive green. It's actually a dark yellow, believe it or not. Um, but those are our brand colors. Um, and in the style guide, they have the RGB color codes, which is red, green, blue, um, CMYK, and that's Cyan, magenta, cyan, magenta, yellow, and K is black for some reason, um, as well as the hexadecimal codes. They all, those codes all give the same information. They tell you what color you're dealing with, but they're used for different purposes. Hexadecimal is for web design, I'll, used a lot in web design and graphic design, you know, any kind of digital design. Um, CMYK is for print, like if you're mixing inks on a printer or printing t-shirts or printing posters and so forth, or uh, books. And then RGB is also used pretty extensively in digital work in Photoshop and, and similar applications. So we include those. If you look at the, the next page of your mood board, you have to include all three of those color codes because you don't know when you might use these, this information. If you're having some um, collateral material printed up at the printers, you need to send them that, that information. Or if you're having a website designed, then you need hexadecimal codes. Um, and that's why I have you exercise that. You're creating your brand colors in this mood board activity. And those colors are used everywhere. Um, this is a page from our course catalog, the actual print book. There's colors, not just in the logo, but even calling attention to the page number. And this warm versus 
pool. You know, if you consider that a dark yellow, then it's warm and warm colors, but it has sort of that warm versus cool color contrast that allows those titles to stand out. Any, any brand you look at, you'll see this. If you look at Burger King, all of their packaging has that red, green, uh, is it no, red, yellow, blue uh, color scheme and logo. The signs, the restaurants, everything, it's repeated because it's consistency. It really drives it in and keeps it uh, in your memory. This is what I was talking about before with the prescribed colors. Yellow is always optimism, orange is always friendly, and so forth. And it really isn't accurate. Sometimes it can be, but not always. Um, again, you know, there's so many other factors. The, the context, the rest of the personality of your company or your brand um, will influence it. Just because you use a, or a yellow logo doesn't mean you'll necessarily be perceived as an optimistic brand. Um, what I have noticed is that a lot of the primary colors, yellow, red, blue, tend to be the more um, conservative brands, like a lot of the business-oriented um, uh, companies like JP Morgan, um, business machines like HP and Dell, Lowe's, General Electric and Bell, um, and then in the red, Texaco, uh, Exxon, and so forth. Whereas when you get into the tertiary, secondary and tertiary colors like orange and purple and green, then you start getting into the more, um, more light, um, more personable brands and sometimes more quirky brands, especially with colors like purple, which is tends to be seen as kind of quirky and and childlike. And then you have sci-fi channel and and Barbie and uh, and some of those more fun types of brands. That's really the only trend, consistent trend that I've seen. Otherwise, um, otherwise it's very much like planning the colors for your characters in a movie. You know, what, uh, how do you underscore the personality that's already there? This is a couple of examples. And again, um, those color relationships we talked about, complementary, analogous, monochromatic, and so forth, work in every context, regardless of medium. Let's take an example of BP. When you look at this, why do you think BP chose those colors for their brand? The various uh, greens and, and yellows of the, the BP logo. And just for context, BP is British Petroleum, so it's an oil company. Any thoughts on, on a, you know, what their re reasoning was for that? Okay. Um, well, when you think of the color green, what comes to mind? What do you associate that? with. And yeah, there you go. Um, Sheila's on the right track there. It's 
They're trying to be a nature friendly company, or at least be perceived as a nature friendly company. Um, green, if you think about um, what the color green has come to mean, it's a lot of the environmental initiatives, environmentally friendly. They're called you know, the green technology and so forth. Um, it is the color of living plants and the color of life, oftentimes. Um, so using that color green and also in combination with the very organic uh, design, it looks like a flower. Um, you, it uh, has that impression of something that's very natural and very perhaps eco-friendly. So it's, it's all public relations, right? It's public image that they're managing. And that's very important for a company like BP that is in a industry that can be very, um, can potentially be very harmful for the environment and has a PR problem because of that. Intel, um, again, it's a business machine. They produce the uh, parts for computers, and so they're more business-like. It's uh, blue and white, very simple, very straightforward, monochromatic design. Um, you know, maybe we can say that this is an example where blue is that trustworthy, that trustworthy business-like color. Not always the case, but in this instance, it is. And Firefox with the complementary orange and, and blue. I call this split complementary. I don't really go into split complementary, but it's um, that's when you have, say, two warm colors paired with a cool color. Still a complementary relationship, but there's just an extra uh, bit of color in there. And so let's go back a second. Look at the, the Burger King logo. It has yellow, red, and blue. Those are the primary colors. And when you get into the packaging and the branding, this is what you see. All the signs use those colors. All the packages use those colors. Not just in the logo, but in everything. Um, if you went to this, the restaurants, you would see this color everywhere. Yeah, so it's establishing the personality. So um, when you do your mood board this weekend for page uh, two, you're going to create your own brand colors. And I want you to consider the color wheel when you do that. Uh, think about what is your brand personality? Are you fun, outgoing? Are you more serious? Um, so forth. And I know, Sheila, I remember that yours, you started to lean towards a color scheme already. Um, and that's, that's great to be thinking of at this early point. But think about um, emotional associations or cultural associations of colors. You know, are you creating the association you want? Or is there some inadvertent, uh, accidental associations that you might be evoking that you don't want? because um, that can sometimes happen. Um, I know in your case, you had a lot of uh, pink and gold. It was a very, it was sort of a, a feminine but strong brand, um, and you were using pink to capture that idea. So, um, so start off with that. So now you have your base color. That's your, your main color for your brand. And then from there, you can decide, do I want it to be more harmonious, more calm, and then go with um, some analogous colors? Or do I want it to be more action-oriented and, and vibrant and exciting? Then you can start combining some, pairing some complementary colors with it. Um, and so you're picking two or three colors. You can, If you want to have a monochromatic brand, that's fine. You can just delete the extra. Uh, the entries on your mood board. If you want to add more, that's fine too. Don't go overboard. I wouldn't go more than four colors total because uh, then you're just getting really busy. Um, you know, unless unless you're planning on incorporating something like a rainbow or something that's just inherently very colorful. Um, so think about what captures your personality. Um, 
the personality of your mission statement, what um, what has the energy and, and feeling that you're going for. Start with that one color and then branch out. If you want to have more colors, do you want to have a calm feel, do you want to have an energetic feel. Um, one of the pitfalls I see is people picking just their favorite color or their favorite colors, plural, that don't really have any connection to one another. They just like them. Like I'm very fond of purple and I'm also very fond of teal and turquoise, but I might not pair those together in a given uh, logo design. You know, think, uh, think critically about the colors you're picking. I might pick one of those that I really like that represents you know, the image that I'm trying to create and then pair that with something that enhances it in some way. Putting a turquoise against a, say, a, a complementary backdrop would help to really make that pop. Or pairing it with some more cool colors can give a more tranquil feel. So put some, th some thought into that. Um, um, rather than simply going with something that has meaning, personal meaning to you. Um, and Sheila, you're, you mentioned that pink, because your colors are pink and gold, and they don't really point to one another. They don't have a direct relationship, and that's true, but they don't necessarily have to. Um, and this is, Color theory, which uses the color wheel, is there as a guide and a reference. You know how these colors are going to react with one another if you know these rules. You're not bound to these rules. Um, if there's a logical reason for you to choose those colors, you can. For example, we, we said pink is a feminine color, so it, it evokes that feeling of femininity. Um, and then through your imagery, you're giving this idea of of uh, strength and and uh, elegance and and um, you know that that aspect of your personality, gold then um, you know brings in another association. Gold is typically uh, a symbol of wealth, a symbol of status, of uh, quality, elegance, some of those themes. So you know if uh, if that's the combination that you want is that feminine aspect with a sense of of uh, class and elegance. Then that combination is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, only thing I'm looking for in your in your mood board is that you give a good rationale for the choices that you make. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be straight from the textbook. If uh, if it if you convince me that you know what you're talking about. Does that make sense? Hopefully. Okay, great. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so not telling you to disregard the color wheel, certainly not, because it's very important um, and very useful. But um, it isn't the uh, it isn't the law when it comes to picking colors. Um, it is a guide. <coughs> Are there any last questions um, before we wrap up? Okay. Well, I appreciate both of you joining me tonight um, in spite of the scheduling changes this week and, uh, and appreciate you bearing it out for this hour and a half that we've been here. Um, but uh, that's all I had for you. So I'm happy to let you get on with your evening. And if you should have any questions, be sure to shoot me a message and I'll hope, try to get back to you as quick as I can.